On Saturday, it was reported that Ryan Day could potentially be a target at Texas A&M before it was announced that Mark Stoops was going to be the guy for Texas A&M before he reneged and said he was going to stay at Kentucky. It was a wild kind of 12-hour period there where there were the reports that A&M was really high on Ryan Day and he was going to be somebody that they targeted, but then they had found their guy in Mark Stoops and that pending board approval they were going to offer him the job and then the word got out and the public backlash was so swift that mark stoops decided you know what i got it pretty good here in lexington i'm gonna stay and i think the the response and the reaction to both highlights kind of the difficulty that comes with texas a&m because i don't think either guy is a great fit for the aggies and it highlights Every problem with Texas A&M is that money can't solve everything. And that's a sad reality that some people in some programs and some teams have to face in 2023. If money, if money bought championships, then the Yankees would play the Dodgers in the World Series every year. They don't. There's a reason for that. I think, one, I, I think the idea that Ryan Day would be, I, I believe Texas A&M would be interested in Ryan Day. I don't know Ryan Day would be interested in Texas A&M. Why would you go from a place at Ohio State where you are now 56 and 7 and there is a portion of the fan base angling for your firing because you've lost to the same team three times in a row? You're going to go to then a, a program that has as equal or maybe more unrealistic expectations, it doesn't really track a whole, like it just doesn't make a whole ton of sense. The idea that like, hey, for just a little bit more money than you make now, you can uproot your family to a job where you have no connection to the area, the recruiting base, et cetera. And for just slightly more money, you can deal with more unrealistic fans. It's not a great sales pitch. Like it just doesn't, like that's not, Something that um, somebody that's a high caliber coach like that that has reached you know the heights of their field is going to be like yeah that makes a ton of sense and it's the same like Dabo Sweeney is listed as a you know somebody that somebody to watch for the Texas A and M job well Dabo Sweeney's struggling with the people with the expectations of people at Clemson the expectations that he set the standard that he created he is struggling with the people at his own school where he is a de facto god, he's going to go to Texas A&M? No. <laughs> it just doesn't make a whole, like, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dabo Sweeney tries to uh, get out of Clemson at some point just because, like, you know, you've probably reached the heights that you're going to get at Clemson. And those were really high highs. They were as good as you can get at any program in America. And maybe it's just time to try something new somewhere else. So maybe he can be lured to Texas A&M. But when you are struggling with the expectations of the fans at Clemson, because you're not living up to the standard you set, I don't think moving to a program where they're going to pay 75 million bucks for a guy to not coach because he didn't beat LSU and Alabama enough I don't I don't think is a a super attractive job for a guy like Dabo Sweeney or Ryan Day. In Mark Stoops case, it's almost the exact opposite. Right now in Kentucky, the expectations are be good enough. And I think they've got reasonable fans. I don't think there is a fan base or any any segment of the Kentucky fan base that's sitting around saying like, "Hey, how come you know, we're not getting to the SEC championship game. How come we're not competing for national titles? That's how you know Mark Stoops isn't that good. You know how he, you know Mark Stoops is that good? Is that Kentucky is even remotely relevant. That Kentucky is viewed as one of the stronger opponents on Georgia's schedule. That's how you know Mark Stoops is doing a great job. But he's highly compensated for that job because he's working wonders. Kentucky is a bad job. <laughs> Kentucky is a difficult, difficult, difficult place to win in college football. The recruiting base is not great. The resources aren't really there. They're committed to basketball rather than football. 
in your division for the last 10, 15 years has been a Florida team that was once a juggernaut, Georgia, who's now a juggernaut. It's not, it's not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination. And he's done a really great job there, but apparently not good enough for Texas A&M fans to think that he was worthy of being their head coach. And I know that when you are going to fork out the money that you're forking out to fire Jimbo Fisher, that you want and expect a big name like that is logical. That makes total sense to me, but big name. If you have to weigh big name or really good football coach, I think you should want really good football coach. And I think that might be where the, uh, where the, the line in the sand is for, why Texas A&M is kind of viewed how it is. I, I know that there are people like there, there are people in this college football podcast space that will tell you that Texas A&M is an elite top five job in America. I don't think it's a top five job in the SEC, to be frank, now that Texas and Oklahoma are in the conference. It's just not. Getting paid, somebody being, being willing to pay you a lot of money does not a great job make. It just doesn't. If you were... Uh, I thought Matt Rule's comments last week were spectacular, where he told one of his assistant coaches, like, you're you're going to be a, a, a head coach. Don't take a job where the expectations are bigger than the commitment. And I'm not saying that, I, that Texas A&M, the expectations are bigger than the commitment, but there are some schools that are like that. There are some schools where, um, like, for instance, Indiana opened up today. They fired Tom Allen, and we'll talk about, some of the firings and hirings here throughout the week. But there is somebody who will talk themselves into that they can be the one, be the coach that turns Indiana around and makes them into a really good program. I don't know who that is because like Kentucky, Indiana is a really difficult job. It is one of the more difficult power five jobs out there. And I guess after this weekend, maybe it should be power four. I don't know, but it's one of the more difficult jobs and somebody's going to talk themselves into I can be the guy that turns this thing around and makes this uh, a powerhouse. And I don't know that that is possible, but somebody's going to take that job. But like Kentucky, I, I don't think the expectations are unreasonable. Basically, the expectations at Indiana are like make a bowl game every year. If you can get to six and six, and if the schedule, if the athletic director can help you schedule to where it's, almost a given that you're six and six because like Indiana doesn't have to build a non-conference schedule where they have to worry about what the college football playoff committee is going to think about their non-conference schedule. They just don't. You can schedule a couple Mac schools and an FCS school and like, okay, <laughs> three, and know, great. And now you've just got to hope that you can beat Purdue, Illinois, Northwestern, Maryland, Rutgers, you know, the bottom feeders of the big 10 and take your lumps against the Michigans, Ohio States, Penn States, Wisconsin's, Nebraska's of the world, USC, Oklahoma, USC, Oregon, Washington. It's not a bad strategy, but if you can get to six and six every year, you're doing a hell of a job at Indiana. Tom Allen wasn't able to do that outside of the years he had Michael Penix Jr., a generational talent. So when the out when the expectations outweigh the commitment, you've got this You've got this situation where your priorities are crooked. And I think that's the problem at Texas A&M, where they want a big name. Well, I don't know if you noticed, the last guy you had was a big name. He won a national championship before he came to your program. And you thought he wasn't a very good football coach. Like I, this is crass, but I, I always kind of compare those coaching searches to, remember when you were in high school and you were dating this girl that was kind of a prude and you broke up with her to kind of just go date like a tramp? <laughs> like you just wanted somebody who's going to put out. You're always looking for the exact opposite of what you got, right? And then once you realize that that girl named Tiffany, who's a psycho, like you, you just want somebody who's like going to go to the church youth group and kind of just be stable for a while. And then you're going to repeat the cycle. If you wanted a big name, you had a big name. Jimbo Fisher was a big name. The reason you hired him was because he was a big name. And then you turned out to think he wasn't a very good football coach. So why then when a really good football coach is like, yeah, I'll come to your school. The fan backlash is ridiculous because they thought if somebody with the last name Stoops was going to be their head coach, it better be Bob, not Mark. Mark Stoops done a great job. Mark Stoops, really good football coach. 
but that's not what AM fans want. And so they lead this revolt, which they're entitled to their, if they think they know what's best or they have strong opinions that that guy's not the guy, completely understand it. No qualms about it. It's similar to the Clay Travis-led revolt of Greg Schiano going to Tennessee a few years ago. Now, be careful what you wish for, because I tell you what, Greg Schiano would have done a better job at Tennessee than Jeremy Pruitt did, but you get these blinders on that, I hope Texas A&M doesn't fall into the, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, of the SEC blinders of, like, there's not a college football world outside of those 14 schools. And so, by God, your options are Lane Kiffin, Mark Stoops, or you got to hire a coordinator. Well, that sucks. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to temper A&M fans' expectations here that, like, if you are strictly shooting for big names, you can't then be disappointed if a really good football coach takes your job because you're likely to strike out on really big name guys because, and I, I, I think I will die on this Hill that the idea that a and M is a great job, but hasn't been a great program. Doesn't compute to me. Like if it's a great job, that's a place where you can have great success. Kind of no matter how stupid you are as a coach. And I don't think Jimbo Fisher stupid. I don't think Jimbo Fisher won a national championship at Florida State and then forgot how to coach. I think there are bigger things at play there at AM than people that aren't outside of the that people inside the SEC and inside the state of Texas don't realize. So you can pay somebody a lot of money, but that doesn't mean that the job is great. If that's your priority, fine. But if your priority is you want to win a lot of football games. You want to win a national championship. You want to stand on top of the college football mountaintop. I don't know that Texas A&M is the best place to accomplish that. It's a great place to make a boatload of cash, a place that has low cost of living. And if that's what you aspire for as a coach, that's great. But the fan base it doesn't see it like that. The fan base doesn't go like it's a great place for somebody to make a lot of money and not lead us to where we want to go. It's just not the, and I don't think there shouldn't be a fan base where it's like, you know what? The, the, the pros of our job is you're going to make a lot of money and we're going to have unrealistic expectations for you because we're giving you a lot of money. It's not a great, it's not a great marriage. And I don't think it would have been a great marriage for Ryan Day in Texas A&M. I don't think it would have been a great marriage for Mark Stoops in Texas A&M because for Mark Stoops, the expectations are if you can win nine games, if you win 10 games in a season, like you are the cat's meow at Kentucky. And it's because their fan base kind of knows you're working with a kind of one hand tied behind your back compared to other competitors in your conference. The Kentucky job is a D tier D tier job in the SEC. And Mark Stoops has them competing as a B tier program in the SEC. He's doing the exact opposite. He is producing results that are not in line with the commitment and the expectations. So moving to a program like Texas A&M, where the fan base believes that's an A-tier job, the fan base believes, the, the boosters, the administration believe this is an A-tier job, you should produce, produce A-tier results. I don't think it's, and I don't, I just don't think the idea that NIL money and the idea that the program is willing to pony up. And I had this conversation with a friend yesterday that was like, well, you know that a and is not going to pony up the money and have the stupid contract that they had Jimbo Fisher. Well, they're going to have to. You have to have that. You want somebody to leave their job like Mark Stoops at a really cushy situation or Dabo Sweeney or Ryan Day, you're going to have to overpay. And with the overpayment comes extra expectations because you're being paid as the top college football coach in America. By God, you better produce the results of the of a top five coach in America. And I don't think that's a program that you can accomplish that at. So if you think about it kind of logically, linearly, like I don't know that this is a great opportunity for a lot of folks. Now, for some people, it might be. For Jeff Trailer at UTSA, this is probably a primo opportunity. But if the AM fan base is expecting a huge name, is Jeff Trailer going to get the job done? Is Jeff Trailer going to move the needle? Is he going to win the press conference? Probably not if Mark Stoops didn't do it for you. Now, maybe Jeff Trailer has enough cachet in Texas high school coaching uh, circles that maybe he does 
look and feel like a home run hire for a and I just think if Mark Stoops, and, and like I saw somebody, Mark Stoops is 25 and 55 in the SEC. Yeah, at freaking Kentucky. <laughs> the fact that they've won 25 games in the SEC is a miracle. The guy has worked miracles. So there are conflicting reports out there of whether he had a change of heart or whether the fan backlash was so strong that the board of regents there at a was like, ah, hell, we can't do this. But if that's if that's the case, I don't know who is on the list of folks that the administration, the program, the fan base, the state is going to find acceptable. But I think Mark Stoops should have been on it. So if that's where you are already, where one of the like, 10 best candidates for your job was like, yeah, I'll come. And the fans are like, to hell with that. I don't know where you move from here. Now, crazier things have happened. I never would have guessed that Brian Kelly would have moved his family to LSU, but I don't, I just, I guess my crystal wall doesn't foresee a hire at A&M that makes everybody be like, hell yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This guy's going to take us to the top. I just don't see that coming. And so I think if you already have had your expectations heightened because you have had the ability to affect one potential hire, I don't I don't know where you go from there. But I just don't think Mark Stoops, Ryan Day, Dabo Sweeney were natural fits at AM. And if and, and I think that might be the problem is if you're not if you're looking for the biggest name rather than the best football coach. I don't foresee your fortunes being overturned really anytime soon. So it's time for the Sunday Stiff Arm Trophy update now. And when you take a look at my Heisman ballot, which doesn't exist, so take completely no stock in this, but it's something we've done every Sunday throughout the college football season because I think it's been fun to uh, track. Like at one point, Hawaii's quarterback was going to be second in the Heisman Trophy voting. But it is getting down to the nitty gritty where everybody, well, really not everybody, but a couple of guys have one more opportunity to showcase why they should win the Heisman Trophy. And I've got a change at the top of my Sunday Stiff Arm Trophy update. I have to go Jaden Daniels at the top right now. I'd have to vote for Jaden Daniels to win the Heisman Trophy. Joe Burrow had one of the all-time great seasons in college football history, and Jaden Daniels is putting up better numbers than that. And I think that's kind of all you have to say is that, like, hey, despite – like. And and I, I mentioned this earlier in the year where I I kind of weigh like, okay, where would Washington be without Michael Penix Jr.? Would they be undefeated and in line to make the college football playoff? No. Would Oregon be one of the best teams in America without Bo Nix? No. Would Ohio State be 11-1 and one without Marvin Harrison Jr.? No. Would LSU be where LSU is right now without Jaden Daniels? I don't think so. I don't think that's anybody that you can kind of plug and play in that offense and say, you know what, without Jaden Daniels, they're nine and three. I just don't think you can, I don't think you can say that. I think what he's done has been individually incredible. And I think you have to reward that. So I, it, I've kind of waffled on whether you know, like Marvin Harrison Jr. I think is the best player in college football. He didn't produce results that were in line with that, but, he is the best player in college football. Individually, the most outstanding player in the sport this year has been Jaden Daniels. So I have to go ahead and give my Heisman Trophy vote to him right now. Now, both Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. have the opportunity to leapfrog him. And I think in a lot of voters' eyes, that is still a possibility that one of those two guys with their performance can send – Bo Nix to the, to the trophy, can send Michael Penix Jr. to the trophy. But right now, I have to put Jaden Daniels at number one. What he's doing is incredible, and it's better than what Joe Burrow did when he had one of the great all-time seasons in college football history. Now, I will say, if we go back, and I'll pull this out at some point, you go back into the archives of the Daily Huddle podcast, I told you that Jaden Daniels would win the Heisman Trophy in the season preview episode. I also told you that LSU would win the national championship, and that didn't work out. But... I told you Jaden Daniels won the Heisman Trophy, so I got kind of a biased opinion here, but he hadn't been at or near the top of my list the last couple of weeks. But when you 
put it all together and look at it like, yeah, you know what? He's got a really strong case. Despite them being, despite LSU being nine and three, he's got a really strong case for why he should win the trophy. So right now he's got my vote. Of course, I don't have a Heisman Trophy vote, so it doesn't matter. I'd like one. I don't know who I got to bribe for that, but let me know what the like going rate is and we'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> That'll do it for today's episode of the Daily Huddle. Well, we've got a lot to talk about this week. Coaches are going to get fired. Coaches are going to get hired. Who's going to make right decisions? Who's going to make wrong decisions? Who got fired that shouldn't have? Who's keeping a job that shouldn't have? We'll talk about it all this week, plus Conference Championship Saturday coming up. Got plenty to talk about. Can Iowa beat Michigan? Hell if I know. I don't think so, but we'll talk about it all this week here on the Daily Huddle. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you're getting all the great college football content we're pumping out here at Saturday Glory. If you are listening on the podcast, drop a five-star review. It goes a long way in helping out the channel. We'll see you tomorrow right back here on the Daily Huddle with Saturday.